Welcome to Hatfield House for the ninth Hatfield House Chamber Music Festival. Thanks to the glories of the virus, we've had to go uh, viral, if that's the right word, uh, this year. And uh, we're extraordinarily grateful to everybody who's taken to this new form of festival with such enthusiasm and such skill. I hope that you'll enjoy our virtual festival this year and that we can go back to normal next year. Uh, one of the things that has been suggested is that uh, as part of the performance that we should try and set the wonderful music that you're about to hear into context uh, and the context of Hatfield House. Uh, the builder of this house uh, was a busy politician. He followed his father as the most powerful man in England uh, until his early death, mainly from overwork, I suspect, although it was really a form of cancer. He spent his time governing England, but he had other obsessions as well. He, of course, was passionate about architecture, but among the other arts, one of his other passions was, was music. So much so that he had his own uh, set of musicians. Uh, the lutenist Cooper, who, according to the uh, conventions of the time, corrupted his name to the more professional sounding Caprario. He commissioned, for instance, the great composer Dowland, uh, and he kept his uh, set of musicians busy at Hatfield until his untimely death in 1612. So uh, it might be of interest uh, now that uh, thanks to the persuasiveness of Guy Johnson that uh, we are once again making Hatfield a centre for fine music. If we set the history of the house and some of its context of its contents in the context of what we're doing for the music festival and help us through, in my own ignorance of, of the contents, we're very, very lucky indeed that uh, Dr Emily Burns has kindly come to help us discuss some of the works of art uh, that um, the house contains. Uh, perhaps I ought to say that, uh, as one of my daughters is wont to, to remind me, we're not Chatsworth, we don't have any Rembrandts, or classical great works of art. Uh, our real treasure, of course, lies in our library and in our archive. But there are some interesting pictures, some of which have considerable relevance to the music that you are going to hear during the course of the festival. And Emily is very kindly going to help us talk about some of them and set um, them in the context of the history of the house. And I hope you'll enjoy it. At the time that these three composers, Beethoven, Schubert and Mendelssohn, wrote the pieces that we're hearing in this concert, the piano was on a roll. It was a relatively recent invention. It had come about in some ways in the, in the middle of the 18th century because the harpsichord, brilliant as it was, couldn't really vary the tone that it played or the dynamic level. In other words, once you'd chosen the level of loud or soft on a harpsichord, you were more or less stuck with it. Something more expressive was required. An instrument appeared called the clavichord, which certainly you could play in a way more like the piano. You could make it play quietly or loudly and change very rapidly, like a human voice singing. But the problem with the clavichord was that it was tiny and inaudible from more than about five feet away. It was the perfect instrument for playing in a small apartment, but in a concert hall it was absolutely useless. So the musical technicians got to work on devising a kind of keyboard instrument that had all the brilliance and range of the harpsichord, but the expressiveness of the clavichord, and gradually it began to work. As the music te musical technician has discovered more and more things like how to build stronger frames so that you could make the strings tighter. That meant that the instrument could play louder. How to sustain the tone so that instead of just dying away, the note would hold like a voice singing. And the remarkable thing was that as the instrumentalist did this, 
the composers responded. They sensed almost immediately that here was a new way you could write for a keyboard instrument. This was something which now had the ability to sing. In fact, one reviewer of a concert of Beethoven's in which Beethoven played his own fourth piano concerto for the first time in public was very struck by the way that he actually underlined it, by the way Beethoven actually sang upon the instrument. This was something new, the idea that you could make an instrument, particularly a keyboard instrument, sing. And this was partly as a result of the development of the instruments that was going on at the time, partly because composers like Beethoven and Schubert were very keen to find ways of singing on instruments. Beethoven's clarinet trio for, for clarinet, cello and piano actually reflects another interesting development in instrument making at the time because the clarinet itself was a very relative, relative newcomer to the orchestra and to the concert hall. Uh, Mozart had been so enthused by the clarinet and by the playing of Anton Stadler that he'd actually changed some of his music so that he could incorporate this new instrument. And Beethoven responded to it too, to its vocal qualities. More than any of the other woodwind instruments, the clarinet has an ability to sound like the human voice and capture some of its nuances of expression, as well as its wonderful legato phrasing. And you can hear that particularly in the slow movement of the Beethoven trio. But this isn't just a, a kind of aria of a clarinet and with piano and cello accompaniment, because chamber music at this time was taking on a completely new life of its own. Haydn had famously boasted in his Opus 33 quartets that he'd created a new and original way of composing. What he'd done, and it was quite true, was create a kind of style of dialogue between the instruments, not the elegant formal dialogue of a Bach or a Handel fugue, but something much more like a conversation going around, on around a table between friends, where people react to what each other are saying. So that you, for instance, somebody might say, pass the marmalade, and someone else says, marmalade? Do you want marmalade? And the way that a musical instrument, a musical phrase might be taken up by one instrument and then taken up by another one, then handed back to the original instrument. There's something of the way that a conversation might unfold around a table. This was an age that valued conversation, particularly discourse, as a way of getting out against a way of getting to the truth of things. And you can hear that particularly in the chamber music of the time. You can even hear it too in Mendelssohn's D major cello sonata, even though this is in some ways an early romantic work. Still here, very important for Mendelssohn are the way that the cello and the piano are able to converse with each other. And it's beautiful writing from that point of view. Mendelssohn really understands the character of the cello at a time when the cello wasn't that common as a solo instrument. Certainly nothing like as common as the violin, and certainly nothing like as common as it was to become, the cello was to become in the 20th century. As for the Schubert Impromptu, Opus 90, number two, this is again an example of Schubert at his a most vocal in writing for an instrument. Schubert was almost above all else the master of song. And when he writes for a musical instrument, you're aware that the voice is somewhere in the background. These musical impromptus, the word kind of means something just thrown away, kind of in the spur of the moment. Yet they don't have that quality at all. They seem to be a distillation of something very important, very beautiful. And here, there's a quality almost like a song without words. In fact, listening to this, it's sometimes easy to imagine that there could be words to this music because it speaks so directly and so vocally. Now, Melvin Tan is playing on a modern piano, but he has long experience of playing on the pianos of Beethoven, Schubert and Mendelssohn's time. And he's able to bring something of that quality to his playing. So if he doesn't sound like the kind of rich romantic playing that you may be used to, there's a reason for that. Because Melvin knows very well the kind of sound that Beethoven, Schubert and Mendelssohn would have had in mind. A different kind of action, for instance. The piano of that time, for instance, would speak much more clearly. You'd be much more aware of the gaps between notes, in a sense, than of long, flowing, elegant lines, which are so suited to the modern piano. To get that effect requires a bit of work, but I'm sure you'll agree that Melvin's very good at it, and it's a marvellous way, I think, of bringing us closer 
to what it was that made each of these composers so inspired by the sound of this exciting new instrument.
Well, Emily, as you see, we're now in the, what we call the Marble Hall. Mm -hmm. In a way, a rather anachronistic room, I think, um, in the sense that um, if you look at the somewhat later Queen's House in Greenwich, which um, let in a, a complete architectural revolution, I think if you were a parvenu family like ours, um, you rather liked having a medieval hall, <laughs> which um, implied that you were rather grander in descent than we actually were. <laughs> uh, and essentially, it's what was always here. There was a much higher fireplace, which was cut down by the Victorians. Um, and the ceiling is original, except that it was done over in the 1870s by some Italians called Taldini. Uh, I think they did rather a good job. Um, but the rest of it is pretty well as was. The um, cupboard is the only bit of, bit of furniture we know which survives from the great palace at Tibbles, which uh, was built by the great Lord Burley, the father of the builder of this house. And I think it's one of the few things, mm. apart from some pictures, that he brought with him. But, of course, the thing that we really want to talk about here is um, the rainbow portrait, which is one of the famous pictures we do have um, of Queen Elizabeth I. And you know a great deal more about it than I do, I think. Well, this is, of course, one of the most famous portraits of Elizabeth I. Um, so, because of its name, it's called the Rainbow Portrait. Um, you can't quite see the rainbow anymore because over the course of time, the pigments have faded and changed colour. And so the original brightness is now really held by her amazing gown, which is covered in quite an unusual pattern of eyes and ears, which is on the one hand said to represent her great fame. She was, of course, a great propagandist, and um, there are many portraits of her and many writings and sonnets to her. She very much encouraged this. But on the other hand, um, it's uh, possibly not too subtle reference to her being the eyes and ears of the country, the nation, and of course her spy network headed by Walsingham. Um, so it's a sort of not so subtle hint at how she has knowledge um, beyond the immediate surrounds of the room she's standing in. She is actually about, this is around 1600 this was painted, and she's actually in her 60s at this time. So not really as she appears in this picture. Um, and Sir Roy Strong um, once called this the, the mask of youth that she essentially cultivated towards the end of her 45 year um, time of rain. Yeah. She's got flowing locks like a, like a virgin, you know, people would wear that before they were married. And of course she cultivated this image of her as being a pure and untainted virgin married only to her, her nation and to God. Um, and that's supported by um, the pearls she adorns herself with, a sign of purity. Um, and then also we have this uh, beautifully intricate coiled snake with um, a sphere on top, which is a reference to wisdom and intelligence. So that paired with the eyes and ears is her um, intelligence network, um, which decorates her dress. And of course, spies were necessary, weren't they? Because Absolutely. Uh, after the papal bull of 1570, Regnans and at Chelsea, so if you were a Roman Catholic, you had to choose mm -hmm. between your faith and loyalty to the queen and uh, things really got serious after that. Uh, hence, effectively, the great tradition of, of, Eng of English spy, spy mastery was born there. It happened, was beginning before in the reign of Henry VIII, I think, but Burley yeah. and Walsingham were, as you say, were the great masters. And of course, mm. we had this, uh, you know, I've always thought this was really about her. It's uh, all about her. It's all about her, isn't it? non sine soliaris, she's the sun, there's the rainbow, there's no rainbow without the sun. So, gross piece of flattery. Yeah, and she's also in a sort of, um, sort of mask costume. You know, this isn't just state dress or court dress, this is um, fancy dress. Um, and she and the other Tudor monarchs, were, and also the Stuart monarchs, were great fans of the court mask of dress up. Yeah. And it suggested that she might be um, the moon goddess, which again is paralleled with a the theme of purity. Oh. Um, and there's a sort of Diana, slight cre yeah. Di Diana yeah. the crescent sort of moon shining at the very top of her 
headdress yeah. is a reference to that. The artists of the day were actually employed consistently to decorate mask costumes, decorate the royal palaces, decorate the barges mm -hmm. and the carriages. You know, if you were the court artist, you weren't just painting portraits such as this you would be probably employed in many other ways and taking likenesses was only one very small part of your job. So it's impressive that it's actually um, so good. It's been attributed in the past to Isaac Oliver, who's also a miniature painter. Um, and um, the attribution is often quite complicated with these sorts of pictures. Who do you think it's by? Do you think it's by Gerrits the Younger? I think Gerrits is, is a definite possibility. Um, yeah. The, yeah. There, is, there are pros and cons to both, I think. Um, but what you cannot deny is that it's an extremely powerful image of a very confident ruler at the end of her reign. Yes, and of course that hair is a wig, wasn't it? Yep. And that awful makeup, which no doubt poisoned her. Yes, it had lead, lead, lead. To, to, to cover as a sort of con foundation concealer, which apparently made your skin grey and shriveled, was the quotation. Um, that's it didn't, recorded. didn't improve her complexion, whatever. No, but here she is youthful, youthful and beautiful.